Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another virtual edition of Mike Up Sports, the show that goes in depth with the people who build our sports community. And joining me from her place somewhere in Minnesota, I'm not exactly sure, is an athlete that is known for getting more rebounds than points, but that's all right. You can see her getting boards whenever games resume at Creighton University in Nebraska. She did a lot of that for Apple Valley High School. Michael Parham. Michael, thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So, Michael, you are a Division I basketball player, one of many to come out of Minnesota. And so I'm wondering, when did you get that first itch to play the sport? So the first time I started playing basketball, like the first actual itch was in sixth grade. Um, I didn't play any time up until then. My brother and my dad would go to the park all the time and they would shoot. And I was up there and like, I, I was like, no, I'm not playing. I refuse to, I wouldn't do it. My sister started playing before me and I go to all her games, cheer her on. I was like, I'm not going to play. I'm not going to do it. And then I would say it was at the end of like fifth grade, one of the parents turned to me and I was like, of course, one of the tallest girls in class. And she turned to me and she goes, you know, you're really stupid for not playing basketball. And I was just like, okay. Well, maybe I should try it out. <laughs> like, what well, could be like? It can't be so bad. So I tried it out. Um, I played how like in house like uh, community basketball, sixth grade, and I had such a good time with it that I started doing traveling. And then after a year of traveling, I played my first uh, first season of AAU, and then just from there, it just like skyrocketed my experience and how much I started to love it. And now I'm here. So yeah. So you said your sister played before you did? Yeah, she did. she played before I did. She doesn't even play anymore. So I was going to say because I remember your dad telling me she can't stand basketball now. No, nope, she cannot. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's like uh, the roles flip. And so I just find that really amusing. She took it up. Now she doesn't want to be anywhere near a court. Uh, you mm -hmm. take a little longer, and here you are still playing. Yeah, and I definitely, um, so I started out doing like gymnastics and running track, doing volleyball, um, all those like, uh, like a, dump, a bunch of other sports. And now my sister, um, she's a senior at ECU. She, um, she's going to go on to run track at Viterbo University. And so it's just interesting. Like I started out, my first sport was track and now she's, her sport, first sport was basketball and it's just like flipped. So do you talk some smack with her about that, that, you know, you're playing basketball and she <laughs> decided to move elsewhere? Sometimes, like, we just tease each other about random things. Like, I don't know, like, she'll talk about how, like, oh, she had, like, a winning bucket and things like that. I'm like, okay, well, I have that too. Um, different things like that. And on top of that, I have to imagine – the family feuds were amusing because you told me your, your sister finishing up at Eastview and I know you took part in track uh, throughout your high school career. So yeah, I know in track, you don't compete against each other the way you would in basketball or other Ooh. sports, but you still do. <laughs> right. You still compete, but it's not like a one-on-one -on -one situation. Yeah. But that being said, what was that dynamic like where you're both student athletes at rival schools? Because mm -hmm. most folks would think that would be blasphemy because Apple Valley and Eastview have that crosstown rivalry. And in your household, that was the case. Yes, it was, it was something I can distinctly remember so many like times. Um, so one of the times, like I just like, I had to get at her. So we used to have the battle of the apple. Are you familiar with that? I haven't heard of it, but I can get the name. I went to yeah. a St. Paul school, so I mean, we had oh, a different, okay, ri yeah. different rivalry. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that makes sense. Or like Ho Richfield, Holy Angels, Battle of the Tracks, yeah. the Lakeville schools. Yeah. So. so, yeah, it was Battle of the Apples, and it's a football game, and it's like a, a fundraiser for cancer as well. And so Apple Valley, of my years there, I think we won. We thought we didn't do it one of the years. Um. I think we won like, all I remember is we won one year and we beat ECU, right? I got home first, Landis got home and I was like, who just won the Battle of the Apple? Who won? We did. And I was screaming, hollering. 
And I was like, don't you regret going to ECU now? And I was just rubbing it in her face. Um, so that's just like the app about ECU, like school-wise. And then when it came to track, she, um, she went to ECU to like make her own name, make her own path for herself. Um, Cause my brother and I went to Apple Valley and we were very involved in sports and just in school in general. So she wanted to do that, but at a different school. And so I always laugh because one of her first days of track, she goes, um, they had her introduce herself and uh, she, she's like, oh, hello, hello, my name is Parham. And there all the captains were like, are you my Kel sister? And then they instantly put her in high jump, hurdles, like sprints and all the events that I did. And the one event that I kept off limits was the 400, which ultimately was my last race I ever ran. And I loved it. I probably should have done that. Anyways, that's what she turned to. And now she runs 400s and she's really good at them. And so like we've kept, she kept our um, events separate so we wouldn't compare like our times and things like that. That being said, even though you didn't pl- compete in the same events, uh, how surreal was it to meet up for track events with your rival school dynamic? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So also I want to add to the last one. We competed one time against each other and that was, I think during like a section meet, um, it was the four by one and we were both the anchor. And um, so I was like, Oh my gosh, like guys, we, I cannot let my sister beat me across the finish line. Get a good start. I will finish us off. I, I will do whatever. So, like, um, I think my my team ended up winning the race. And, um, like, but she, I could feel her there. I could, like, feel her behind me. I was like, okay, I can't. Like, I think that's what motivated me to finish. Um, and then, uh, wait, what was your other question? Last one? Well, just the, the dynamic, because it's not often that, a sibling oh, yeah. to at a rival school so when the two of you would meet up it sounds like you did compete right. in one event against each other but you know uh what were those meetings like when you would you know get together during breaks or after a right. meeting <laughs> right. what were some of those conversations like yeah so it's actually so interesting like when it comes to being competitive um at the and ec like it's like we gotta win we gotta win but other than that like a couple of the coaches at ecu are Apple Valley grads and they graduated with my coaches and so the two teams are actually really close um and so like even like the girls on the team like if there's one team you're gonna like hang out with and talk to at a meet it's gonna be like an ECU team or something like that um so I was pretty normal um there was a couple times I remember after one meet she like went so hard and she like didn't feel her body my sister well enough that like she threw up and of course, they, they're they like, Michael, go get your sister, go get your sister. I'm like, where are her captains? Like, tell them to take care of her. And of course, though, so I walked over and I helped her back to her camp, and things like that. Um, and that was one of the nice parts about track is like, it's just such a community that like, any meet that like, I was in, Landis would have all the ECU girls cheering me on, or any meet, she was at like, an event, I would have all my girls um, cheering her on. So that was a nice part um and otherwise it was always like joking like trash talk like especially at the end of the meet when you're cheering your teammates on like okay land this must the girl on my team she got you she got you all smoked like she's gonna win she's gonna do this she's like no you don't even know who we have coming next like just things like that and that was always fun to do just like a little banter what was that like just having a sister at you know the rival school for three years where you know the two of you probably come home around the same time and I'm sure the classes are similar you know the sports they're the same but just by attending different schools you get a vastly different experience a couple like the differences like you said like classes should be the same like generally the people that go there should be the same and they weren't like there'd be a lot of classes um where like I would have, I will, like I would have taken that class last year, and then she's taking it this year, and she asked for my help, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I've never seen anyone explain it like this. I'm like, why don't you understand? And for me, like if she had the same teachers as me, I'd be like, oh, this is what she actually meant. But we didn't have the same teachers, so I can't like read the teacher's mind, and so that got a little frustrating and hard to like help her with homework when it came to that stuff. Um, 
And then uh, other things like just the way ECU works sometimes, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you should have just gone out of value with other, like things like that. Um, I'm trying to think of an example, I don't know. Um, yeah, just like the school part was actually got, would get kind of frustrating trying to help her when I didn't know what they needed or were trying to ask her. And then um, like the demographics of both schools, um, I personally, just cause I went there with the Apple Valley is more diverse than ECU. And I think um, that added to more of like a well-rounded experience. Um, and I would say East is pretty diverse, but of course, like I want to say Apple Valley won. So Apple Valley is the more diverse school. Um, what else? Uh, oh, other things that like, I would tease her about, like ECU, the, um, what is it called? The mascot is a lightning bolt. It's not even an animal. Like what kind of school has a mascot that's not an animal, you know? So that's another point for teasing. And uh, something that she had like the benefit of is um, in middle school. So I, we both went to Falcon Ridge Middle School and a lot of the kids um, that go there will go to ECU. And then um, a lot of the kids that go to another uh, middle school in Apple Valley, Valley Middle School will go to Apple Valley. And so I, she had the benefit of like, like all of her friends that she made in middle school going to the same school as her and I had to like I do it out valley make new friends things like that um but I had a lot of friends already through basketball and they introduced me to new people and then from there it was just like it just went but um so she probably had the benefit there with the friends so the two of you would root against each other for football. You know, the two of you were friendly competitors in track. I want to know when it came time for basketball, and I bring this up because you, know, you did get to play Eastview in a section final a couple of years ago. Yeah. Who would Landis cheer for when you had to go against Eastview in those <laughs> South Suburban matchups? Yeah. Okay. So she would act, she would cheer for me no matter what. Um, I remember the first year that we beat ECU. Um, that was Lindsey Robson was on the team, Sarah Teske, Aaron Baxter. I was a sophomore and um, we beat them and it was huge. And I will never forget, my sister was sitting on the, in the ECU student section and I, would look, I looked over and I was like, really? But the thing is, is that like, it was like a, they had a certain theme and she wore like the opposite color, like, she was cheering for me but she wanted to sit with her friends on that side so I was like okay I know where you stand but you still sit on the wrong side <laughs> and like or like there was I remember there was one time like I did something bad so you know how like the season section gets all riled up like air I don't remember what it was it was like air ball or something like that and like she was doing it and then she's like guys 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 that's not nice that's not nice like <laughs> um so there was that. And then like another benefit I had there was I went to middle school with a lot of those guys and little girls, but even like, like Macy Giebert, I went to middle school with her, Lauren Glass, all the girls on that team, I went to middle school with them. So competitions always felt like competitive, but still like very friendly. Um, and like the student section people, like they all knew me personally, like they knew who I was. So um, nothing ever got like too mean or anything. It was just like all like in the spirit of like competition, which is something I really like because I'm so competitive. Now, a couple of minutes ago, you had said one of the sports you took part in before you settled on basketball was gymnastics. And something yeah. I've learned this past year, you know, yourself, Mallory Heyer from Chaska and a few others, you know, whether, you know, tall, short, whatever, taking up gymnastics, I'm guessing it got to a point where maybe yeah. you became a little too big for the sport, but Yep. <laughs> what do you think it is about this gymnastics basketball crossover? You know, I'm not entirely sure, but gymna like gymnastics was something I did way early on in like my competitive like career or sports career, and um, I like I had just such a passion for it. I loved it so much, and so I was practicing. Um, I had a like a like a tryout for like a traveling team. Um, the next day, and we are all at my my non, my grandma's house, and um, we were doing like cartwheels in the background. I did a cartwheel, and my parents seemed to think that I faked it, but like something happened to my elbow, and I was like in a cast and everything, and I missed the tryout, and I didn't do gymnastics for like like two or two years or a year and a half, um, and I like really wanted to get back to it, and so like I went back to it, and I just like 
the lady, this is so funny, the lady was like, can you do like a bar, I don't even remember what it's called, like where you like swing your legs and push yourself up. Does that make sense? Um, <laughs> yeah, so she asked me to do that and my legs just like, this is the floor, my legs were like, they just dragged on the floor. My legs had gotten so long and my arms. So I was just like, okay, um, uh, maybe this may not be for me anymore. Uh, but I tried to like keep at it and I don't know, I just kept growing and growing, but I think it was so, it still worked for me because like when I was little, I was super tall for my age, but I was still like shorter than like the older girls. So then I like, I still fit in with like the gymnast, like build or whatever. But then by the time I started getting taller than all the older girls, I was just like, well, um, I think it's time for me to go, I guess. Like, yeah. What was that like growing up? Because I'm sure you've heard the your share of tall jokes you know, when you were little and as yeah. you're making your way through. I'm guessing you know, it's not a big deal now, but you, know, you stand at six foot two, I think officially on the Creighton roster. And mm -hmm. how did you handle that, you know, making your way through the ranks of school, being one of the tallest kids in your class? Yeah, so like a fun story that I have with that is um, in kindergarten, my teacher would always put me at the back of the class or like the back of the line because um, she would know she had everyone if she saw my head peeking out, like waving and smiling to her. Um, so like it started like early in kindergarten like that. And for me, it was just always kind of fun, I guess, like um, just being like, oh, I'm taller than you. Like, cause like boys at a young age, especially in, in, especially in middle school, are always like trying to measure themselves against me. And I'm like, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. And then like, there was a little bit of a switch when I got to high school, although I was still taller than a lot of the boys. Um, some of them grew taller than me. They're like, yeah, that's right. Like all those years, all this stuff. <laughs> um, so like there was that aspect. And then just like jokes wise, um, I don't know, you always just make the best of it. Like, I'm a pretty goofy person myself, too. So someone says something to me, I'm like, oh, really now? Who's the one talking? Like, and I would just say, like, oh, can you reach something on the bottom shelf for me? Or things like that. Like, just it's all, like, fun and games. A common refrain I often hear from my basketball friends that, you know, play the post or, you know, had that height advantage is usually the hardest thing were to, finding shoes that would fit and clothes that would fit. I don't know if that was oh, your, the case with you. Yes. And especially like, like as a little girl, like, and I don't even mean like little girl, like just like middle school and things like that. We'd go to like the shoe store, like DSW or something like that. My mom and sister would go to their like average size nine, size eight section. I'd have to go to like the section 11 plus section. And all they would have, I hate to say it, is like old lady grandma shoes. I'm like, no 13 year old wants to wear grandma ballet slip like splats or whatever like that and I'd get so mad and when it comes to jeans oh my goodness it's like like uh guys yeah, like I have to order them online to get like a 36 inch or inseam and like that that gets kind of tough but like I know there's a ton of other like girls that are taller than me out there so I'm like I know I'm struggling so your struggle is probably way worse <laughs> That being said, I imagine you found some workarounds or at least places where you can get yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah, for sure. And it didn't seem to affect you too much on the court. You mentioned starting basketball in sixth grade. When mm -hmm. did you sense that I could go somewhere with this? I, wow, I don't even know. That like I distinctly remember the first time that, um, or two times, so I received a letter, like a handwritten letter from a college coach, and that was in, that was sophomore, okay, so like freshman year, summer, like, I don't know, it's, it's hard to describe AAU seasons, um, and then I remember the next summer, which was my sophomore AAU season, so like, let's just say like I don't have a senior AAU season, that, that we'll describe it like that, so my freshman AAU season, I received my first letter, and then it was handwritten. I was like, wow, like a coach took the time to write this letter to me. Like, this is, can I actually do this? And then um, the second memory I have is Melissa at the start of practice pulled me aside and said, um, 
a couple of schools have reached out to me asking about you. They would like to talk to you on the phone, all this stuff. And I like, I would say I, like all of the girls on my team started to like get that like buzz around them. And uh, well, that was the first time, like I like, that was the first time that it happened for me. And I was just like, like I could do that. Like really, they think I'm that good. And for me, like, that affirmation was just so nice to have, like, you're good, you can do this, and, like, and that just gave me even more push and desire to want to play more, and, um, yeah, it's always good to feel, like, wanted, especially, and then, um, just, like, growing up, I would say, like, here and there, like, during AAU practices, um, was my old team, like, Thunder, Minnesota Thunder, or Lady Get Shook, like, they would have, uh, Sometimes they'd have like random trainers come in and things like that. And they would always like pull me aside and say like, Michael, like you got something special, but you have to keep working and things like that. And that always gave me more of like a want and a desire to push. I never knew what they were talking about. I'm like, desire, like a want to do what? Like, cause college basketball wasn't something that I had thought of. And um, yeah, so yeah, I would say the, um, the biggest one for me was when Melissa pulled me aside and said, like, this um, this college team wants to talk to you. They really liked your game. And I was just like, like, this is it. So. Do you recall how many offers you got? Oh, um, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I think I had at least at least 10, I think. Um, I can't remember. I'd like, for me, in the moment when I was going through my recruiting process, I was like, I'm going to try not to count all my offers and try to compare myself to other people and things like that. But now that it's back and I'm like, like, that's your one time thing. You know what I mean? That's a one time thing. Like, you should bask in that as long as you can. Um, because, like, everyone's journey and process is different. And so, like, for, like, for, like, younger girls that are going through that process, I always tell them, I'm like, post your offers when you get them and talk to all the coaches you can, go on as many visits as you can because there's nothing that will ever like replace that experience. Like you're wanted by so many coaches, by so many people and you deserve that. You've worked so hard for that. And uh, that's something I learned from that process and that you should just like, like I tried to take it all in as much as I can. Um, as much as I could and uh, like I just want other people to do that and probably even more than I did so back to your original question I don't remember exactly how many because I never like sat down and counted them but yeah so of all the offers you got and I know Creighton has a Minnesota presence so there's history you're mm -hmm. not a fish out of water in that sense but what led you yeah. to head to the Blue Jays yeah um Honestly, I didn't know anything about Creighton until they called me. And then, of course, like, you have to, like, do your research about the school. So, you, the coach, like, the coaches will tell you, like, look it up, look into us, all this stuff. Um, but what brought me there is when I got to uh, – I, I had gone on all my visits, um, or I was taking all my visits, and that was one thing I really was very adamant about during my process is taking my time. And um, I really enjoyed, like, the campus. The girls on the team were cool. Um, and, uh, for me, like I wanted to, uh, I'd always dreamed of going to school out East and they're in the big East. So like, that was kind of like my compromise that I would be playing out there and I would be still somewhat getting that experience. And, um, so there's that. And then, uh, like just like the reputation that school has, I think was pretty cool. Um, they kind of have like the alumni system that like some of the more prestigious schools out east or you know just the prestigious schools in the nation have like oh you're a Creighton grad let's pull that application out and put that on top things like that um are pretty important to me so um probably those two reasons now earlier you were mentioning your AAU experience and I got to know you well at least when I first heard of you you were with the North Tartan program and it just brought back memories of the players you had on that team. Uh, Macy Giebert, who yeah. went to your rifle school at Eastview, Kelly Tyson, Sarah Scalia, Liza Carlin classed up. And I can't remember every name on that roster, but uh, 
what was that like during those years when you had all of this D1 talent, you know, Liza's going to Marquette yeah. and all of them going to schools that are either in the Power Five or in the case of Cali Tyson, a rising group in South Dakota State. I have to imagine there were a lot of memories, moments, and just fun stories uh, with that group playing yeah. together. Oh, so many. And I have to add that Anna um, Anna and Franny were on that team too. And That's uh, right. Having them having them close was, uh, was big for me. Um, so I have so many memories, like all of our practices, of course, were in like random spots around the state. So we all carpool sometimes. And there'd be times when Anna, um, Anna would pick me up and we would just jam blast the music all the way to practice. And after practice, we'd be absolutely dead. And we would just like, we'd blast the music still. And we'd be so tired. But like the one thing that kept us going was our music, just jamming and um all the hotel um like memories that i have like all of us traveling and um just flying together and just even like practices in general like gerard's practices are so like defense oriented and i would say that's where i got my big like big push um with like loving defense and things like that and um all of us like talking about practice afterwards and just saying like oh my gosh like I can't believe he made us do that and then laughing about it afterwards was always fun or just like there was one game where it was just like we had had this break I don't remember what it was but I told Callie I was like Callie I am so tired I'm gonna look at you probably within the first 30 seconds and I'm gonna give you this look and you're gonna give me the same look and we're gonna keep going we're gonna be so tired and sure enough like within like the first minute there was a foul and I gave her this look I was like and she just looked right back at me and I was like, okay, we can make it through this game. Like, we're going to do it. Just like fun things like that. And I still talk to all of them, um, like on the daily, um, especially during the season, like we all reached out to each other, asking each other how each other was. Because something that a lot of freshmen know, like your freshman year is very difficult and um, you have to have like, you have to be able to talk it out and things like that, especially with people that know what's going on um so all those girls I played AAU with that we always checked in on each other and we'd be like oh I hate this and they're like I hate it too like let's rant about it and it's just good to get that out and they were a lot of the times that outlet for me which is nice and you'll get to go against one of them starting next season or whenever yeah whenever comes first in Liza Carlin so I have to imagine that will be fun and then you know, oh Paige gosh, going to yeah. UConn, UConn back in the Big East. So I remember, I think you told me, like, bring it on. So the next <laughs> yeah. couple of years should be uh, pretty exciting. Yeah, they will be. And also, I can't forget to mention Hannah Purcell at DePaul, too. Um, she, like, she was one of my AAU teammates as well. And it'd be so, like, it's just, like, comforting to, like, go to the games and, like, see her, like, through, the, like, the um, – the handshake line at the end of the game and just like to have a familiar face in like the weird places we go um or I guess the cool places we go uh it just it was nice to have like familiar faces on the other team and um as for like like everything else like it's just nice to know those other people are there and it's like it makes the competition like friendly once again um so I'm excited I can't wait for Liza to be at Marquette we've already been like trash talking a little bit like oh you think you're gonna come in there all this stuff like it's always been love like all love and like I want her to do the best she's ever like I wanted to play the best basketball she's ever played and I know she wants the same for me so I'm excited. Now at Apple Valley and even in Creighton and the chances you got to play what I find most fascinating about you is it's not uncommon for you to get more rebounds than points which you know is not an easy thing to pull off because you know you get at least two points for a field goal three and what have you and I look at your stat line and <laughs> when you were going to Creighton not that I doubted your ability but it's like this is really interesting that you've got this athlete that doesn't put up 20 30 points the way Sarah or Franny Hottinger or Paige Beckers right. do you made it work for you of course but what is it about you where you're fine with Maybe you're not even scoring 10 a night. You, you know, just happy to clean up on the reboard on the reboards <laughs> on the boards and 
know, set other folks up. You don't get that a lot. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just, that's hard. I like, um, just growing up, like, just like every post, like I kind of struggled with finishing and I kept working at it and working at it. Um, like, I just knew like, if, like if one thing I can get the rebound, I may not get my put back, but like, so be it. At least I'm getting a second chances and things like that. And um, that mindset turned into like, um, like in high school a lot, I would like get the rebound and I would toss it out to my teammates, things like that. And I just kind of kept that mentality a little bit when I got to college too, because we're such like an offense, like three like oriented team that I knew I could get like a rebound and, throw it back out to my teammates and they would, you know what I mean? Like they would make a good decision with the ball or they would like th shoot a three and it would go in and things like that. So I just, um, I'm always like my teammates first when it comes to basketball. Um, like I do things for my teammates. And so I think part of that is like, just like that mentality carries on, carries on to the floor where I'm like, I'm going to get this rebound. So-and-so, I, I know so-and-so is in that corner and that she has, she's wide open for the three. Let me throw this to her instead of like, trying to go up with it with girls around me and um, of course like I do try to go up with my putbacks all the time things like that um, but I just feel like just like thinking big picture like my putback with like a couple girls around me or the wide open three of course I'm going to choose the wide open three and maybe that's my Creighton trained uh, three first mentality but yeah I think that's something that that's just like become uh, important to me. And another thing you had to contend with or encounter experience at Apple Valley, you, know, you went to school with you know, Tyus and Trey. I think Trey had been there when you were going to school. And so you yeah. probably saw all this publicity attention going to the Jones brothers, the Apple Valley boys team. And it's hard yeah. to argue against that with what they were able to do. And, on the girls' side, you know, you had some talent, maybe not on a first-name basis compared to the Jones brothers, but you guess you got to do your thing a little more quietly. Just what did you make of all the hoopla on the boys' side while you were establishing yourself on the girls' team? Yeah, that's, that's tricky because I just think that's um, overall, like basketball, like society, that's a problem we have that we, we don't pay enough attention to women's basketball. Um, and like great players are going to be great players, no matter what team they're on, like uh, whether they're on the girls team or the uh, boys team. Um, but I think it helps tremendously to have fans at your games. And in high school, like the girls and the uh, boys, they play on the same night. So a lot of the people and a lot of fans are always going to go to the boys game. And um, of course that was always like frustrating um, but like my senior year, I put a lot of effort into being like, hey, come to the girls game. We're home tonight. Like just hang out after school, like things like that. And uh, we would get like a good crowd of fans and things like that. Um, but like that always was difficult, you know, just like knowing that people are always choosing to go watch the guys play. And um, the way we would like make a name for it. Uh, I remember especially like my um, sophomore and junior year. Uh, like our JV, like our bench team is what they call themselves. Uh, we would like play in this holiday, the holiday tournament in Roseville. And they would like, we won the championship two years in a row. And um, they would always say like, uh, uh, what was it? Like teams win, win games, benches win championships. And it was just like the community we had within our team. Like we would just be our own student section cheering each other on and uh, I think a lot of girls teams end up doing that. Like they just find that like, it doesn't matter like whose parent or like parents are in the stands, but like, it doesn't matter what, how many other fans there are, like your teammates are there to cheer you on and things like that. And I think ultimately that brings a lot of teams closer. And I think that helps my team as well. So looking back at your high school career, what would you say were some of your favorite moments and what was your most embarrassing moment? <laughs> Okay, there's a lot of embarrassing, so I'll go for my favorite first. Um, some of my favorite moments, I would say, uh, one I distinctly remember was the holiday tournament that I mentioned. Um, I, that was on, that was my junior year. Bryn Rowan was on the team, 
And we all know Bryn is a really, really good offensive player. Um, and she's having a great game. And so it, it was tied at the end of the game. And I was like, okay, like, what are we going to do? Like, how am I going to, we're going to go for Bryn, right? Is what I'm thinking. And he was like, Michael, you're going to shoot. And I was like, oh, what, me? You mean her? Like, I was like, so like, I like didn't believe it, but like, I still believed in myself. And um, the play was like, Bryn set a, like I set a screen for Bryn looking like she would come get the ball when in reality it was like a, a lob to me. And it went in and just like, just how everyone erupted. And um, that was just one of like the best experiences ever. And yeah, I'll, I'll probably never forget that one. Um, and then another uh, favorite high school memory, um, I would say you were actually at that game. I, it was my cousin's wedding that day and I had a game. And so I went to the wedding of the first part, came for pregame or came for my game. And then right at the game, I interviewed with you and then I raced back off to the wedding. And that was like the first time I had gotten 16 points, I think, or something like that. Or like that was like the most points I had ever scored in a high school game. And for me, that was just like a turning point. Like, okay, you know what? I can be like, I can be a good defender. Like I can always be better, obviously. Um, but like I can be a good defender and I can be good on offense. Like I can do both. I know how to do both. I've been training for it. Like I can do it. And then I would say above all, oh wait, yeah, above all else, I would say my favorite, um, my favorite high school memory was my first high school memory of playing basketball. And that was the breakdown. That's what it's called, right? The breakdown, the first games of the season. Yep. Breakdown tip off classic. Yeah. Okay. That one. Um, we were playing in that one and um, I was a sophomore and I had like, we were playing against STMA and that was after they just came off their uh, state championship run. Uh, or like they, I think they won state the previous year, something like that. They were this really good team. And we were like, we're going to knock them off the pedestal. Like we're going to be a good team this year. And like, I ended up having eight points. I had like halftime, I had like eight points and 12 rebounds. And the game before that and that game, my name wasn't even in the program. And it was so frustrating. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to make a name for myself. Like people are going to ask why she's not in the program this game. And I think I, I had ended up having like, eight points and like 17 rebounds or something like that. And college coaches were coming up to my, my coaches and my parents, giving them their cards saying like, keep us in, like, we'll like you contact, like we'd like to contact your daughter, things like that. And that was like, uh, that was a really cool moment for me. I think um, just that I like, I had like such an appreciation for the sport um, and like all the things that you can do with it. And that was just really cool. Any silly moments? Yeah. Oh, so many. Okay. So are we just talking basketball in general? Yeah. Like your most school? embarrassing moment in basketball where you're thinking to yourself, I can't believe I just did that. Yeah. So, um, I did the impossible. I think I shot a free throw over the backboard. Um, I don't know how it happened. Um, it was during my first year of basketball in sixth grade and like uh my two refs were like high school men like boys players and I was like oh my gosh like these are my brother's teammates like I want to look like I'm a baller in front of them and I shot the ball over the backboard on a free throw so embarrassing looking back and I'm just like how could you how is that possible like I don't understand I remember another one um an AAU game we were doing so well um we were playing really well that game and I was on the bench and I like like I think Franny did something really well. Like she got the ball still and I jumped up, I stood up and I went to sit back down and my chair collapsed on me. And I like fell and I rolled back on my back and Gerard like quickly picked up the chair, set it up and went back to coaching. And I was like looking around and Callie was just dying laughing at me. And um, all of, uh, so like that was at the time when like most of my teammates were committed. And they said like, like the next week I practiced, they were like, my coaches, when we were talking to them on the phone, they said that they saw you do that. And I was like, really? I was hoping no one saw. And like, just like everyone in the gym, like the chair collapsed and I just like rolled back. And so that was kind of embarrassing, but like also I was doing it for my teammates. So it wasn't really that embarrassing. <laughs> hey, at least you didn't hurt yourself. Right. True. Because <laughs> you know, 
falling back on a chair like that. It's like, oh, that could have left a mark, but uh, yeah, oh my it goodness, didn't, it didn't take that smile off your face. You had a lot of fun with it. So, what did you enjoy most yeah. about wearing the brown and gold at Apple Valley? Yeah, I just I like playing. Like it's the same, it's the same at Creighton, but like I liked playing for my my school and like at a school where like. I'm representing like all my teachers and my teammates and all my like friends and my peers. Um, and I knew all my peers and friends and like that. And I just thought that was so cool to do that for them. And um, I think, I think that was probably the best thing. And just like the band of parents, like even just in the South Suburban Conference, you play so many girls that you grew up playing in against an AAU like all the parents know each other and things like that so um that was always nice like you finish up a game at like um like I finished up a game at ECU and Melissa would come up to me and tell me how good I played or like different things I need to work on other stuff like that or I finished it we play at Lakeville North and um Lauren Jensen's mom is coming over to me and my dad's talking to Lauren telling her like all the great things she did um just like that tight knit community of playing like for high, your high school team. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, and plus, like, we all kind of bonded over, like, the brown and gold jerseys just being kind of, like, a little ugly at times, but making it work. And um, I think, yeah, I think those were, like, some of the nice things. And most importantly, just having, like, my teammates in classes or seeing them in the hallways all the time. Like, it was one of those things where, like, you see in the movies, like, when, like, the jocks see each other in the hallway, they're always, like, like, different things like that. Like, that's what my teammates really would do. Like, we walk past each other, and it was always, like, that one person, like, you know, you're going to say hello to every morning when you see them and, like, a variety, like, different things like that. Who did you look forward to playing against? Um, okay, good question. I would say... I think I might say ECU, even though it was a big challenge every time we played them. Um, that was the one game, like I mentioned before, like that was the one game where the boys and the girls didn't play on the same night. So everyone could come and show up to that girls game. Everyone could come show up to the boys game and you wouldn't be missing out on anyone. And just the energy in that gym every single time, like it was just amazing. Everyone was cheering loud and it was exciting. And um, it was just such a fun, fun time. And um, I'm all about like the, having the energy be crazy in a gym. And like, I love that feeling. And uh, it was like that every time we played these two. So that was pretty exciting. Um, i trying to think of any other school. Uh, I know some schools I didn't like playing. Uh, <laughs> like the gyms were just like Lakeville South gym. The lights are just like, ridiculously they're like a yellow I don't know how to describe it um never like really playing there same with Rosemount it's like you're in a dungeon a little bit um <laughs> uh but EC I'd say it was definitely one of the teams that like I look forward to playing to it playing them every year so who was the toughest player to defend in your time as a high school athlete um well, the first thing that pointed that stood out to me was Rachel Reiki, um, my sophomore year. Um, I had one goal and like both games, both games, I had one goal. I was like, I basically had was face guarding her the whole game. And um, the first game we played them, it was the game we won. And like, I limited her to like 12 points or something that when she was averaging like in the twenties and I was just like, okay, like a little pat on the back, things like that, whatever. Um, I was like, good job, Michael. And then, like, the second game, I didn't I, – I don't know why. I look back, and I'm like, I don't know what happened. But I didn't have, like, the same mentality necessarily. I wasn't face guarding her as hard. I just kind of played almost normal defense on her. And she ended up scoring more points because, like, I was getting screened and things like that because I wasn't so close to her. Um, and so she was just really good. Um, I would say she was definitely one of the hardest opponents I've ever had to guard. I had to guard uh, Kayla Mershon. Um, she's a great player. Uh, I love her style of play. And so that was a challenge to guard her. Um, 
And yeah, I bet I'm forgetting. There's so many great players that come out of Minnesota. And I'm sure I'm forgetting them, but yeah. Now, another thing you did at Apple Valley, which I mm -hmm. found interesting, uh, according to my research, you were a founding member of their Black Student Union. So what led yeah. you to create that group? And what did that experience do to shape your perspective on things? Yeah, um, that's really important to me. I So a group of people had like... Um, one of the girls on my team actually before practice was like my hey my cal we're we're like me and some of my other my friends uh we're thinking about like starting a black student union here would you be interested and i'm just like oh yeah and like like we just took that idea and ran with it and um we had um we had a, a lot of support from a couple of like a strong group of teachers and um i just wanted like our main goal with this was to create like a safe place for black students who felt like their voices weren't being heard for them to like complain or for them to educate themselves or just a variety of things. And um, we wanted to do that and have a good name to it. And uh, I had like other prior experience with other clubs that I was the head of and things like that, or I was a part of. And um, yeah, I don't know what more, but that club, uh, it was really important for me to start that there because I think that um, everyone wants to leave like a legacy at whatever school they're at. And I think that's a big part of mine is starting that safe space and creating that for people. And um, yeah, I think, it's, I think that's important everywhere you go in life is to have those safe spaces for you. How cool was it to be a part of a group, you know, a founding member and what were things that you took away from that some lessons or concepts that you learned that you know, without the black student union getting created at apple valley uh, you wouldn't get to experience yeah i think um one of the most important things i like learned is and i applied is like my leadership skills so i like um just through years of playing sports and things like that i've like created like i've learned a lot of good ways to lead and I was able to apply those and like alter them and challenge myself um, with Black Student Union. And it was another thing that I added on my list of things to do, my crazy list of things to do in high school. And it pushed me to like uh, be really organized and have like plans set up and communicate with all the people on the board and just a variety of things. And um, uh, I think I learned a lot about um, how much I enjoy like being with people and teaching people and um, like sharing my passion for like, whether it be like teaching them about something or even just about um, social justice, things like that, um, very important. So those are some of the biggest takeaways I have. How many folks can say I got to be one of the OGs as, you, as they put it? <laughs> yeah, right, not very many. After you were done at Apple Valley, you finished up your first season at Creighton. Yeah. What was it like being a division one college athlete, even though the ending was abrupt with our COVID-19 situation, yeah. you still got to experience a full season. What would you make of the, of the, of the division one experience so far? Um, okay. I would say it's both like amazing. And then also like, there'd be times where I just like, like this, like, I don't know, it's hard to describe, like in the moment, I, I don't recognize it. Like, I just feel like I'm a normal student. I just, I just happened to play basketball for the school, things like that. Like, it just felt like, like high school, you know, it was like something I signed up for almost. And then like, now that it's over, like I was working out um, earlier this week and it just kind of hit me. I was like, wow, I actually play division one basketball and and like, that's kind of a big, like, I was like, that's kind of a big deal. I was like, use that as motivation. Uh, I was using that as motivation to get me through uh, my workout. And it's just so interesting to like, think about that. Um, Cause it honestly just feels like, I just like signed up for it. Kind of like in high school um, or like even with AAU and traveling basketball community, you just sign up to play your sport and 
you have practices and you have games and your parents come to the games and things like that. So that was like really interesting for me. And um, uh, yeah, and I think another thing um, is that it was pretty cool, like uh, like the support for like student support from uh, when you when I got to the high school or college level it was still kind of the same. Like a lot of people, even though the games were on the same days, a lot of people would choose like not to come to our games, things like that. But of the people that I knew, like the people on my floor in my hall, um, they'd always come to the games and support. And like that meant a lot, just always know that they were there supporting um, like that group of friends. And um, my classmates uh, were always come. And the people that I made friends with that were from Omaha would have their parents come. Um, my, one of my, men my mentor that I um, met she would come to the games all the time. So it was nice to have like that group of people always there to support. What was the biggest adjustment process for you going from the high school ranks to the division one college level? Mm, okay. Um, uh, I would say basketball wise, um, like I wouldn't say like, I like my expectations were high like I knew things were going to be a lot harder things like that so nothing like was like overly like whoa I wasn't prepared for this but um some things like like the style of play I wasn't used to that like I I don't know I've I've never been the scorer on my team because I've always been surrounded by other scores and that's the same thing but um it's always like in high school and AAU it was like all like well-rounded like there was girls on my team that drove a lot or there was girls on my team that shot three a lot um, but then when I got to school, like, um, college, like post do a lot of screening. And that was something that like, you just have to learn how to do. Um, and you wouldn't even think like, that's one of the first things you learn how to do, how to screen. And I felt like I had to relearn that all over again. Um, cause that's so different. Uh, and then like also creating a team that shoots a lot of threes. And, um, so like that was, uh, that was kind of a, a change in just like a style of play. That I just had to get used to um and then another like mental thing I guess um just like when it comes to high school and AAU you're one of the people that plays a lot of the game things like that and then when you're a freshman on a team you don't really have to play that much so like just getting used to that and still pushing yourself to be in good condition to play and things like that um that was kind of hard to adjust to. Um, yeah, I would say those two things were like the, the two somewhat challenging things. Now, as, at any point, has there ever been a part of you that dreams of getting a 20 and 10 game? As you mentioned, like I, I ended up covering your game with your career high in scoring. Have you ever thought to yourself, oh, would it be, be nice to have like a 20.10 rebound game or get five, 10 blocks, something like that? Oh, for sure. Like I, I, I dream of that. Like that's my goal every game is I want to go out there and score and I want to go out there and get as many rebounds and blocks as possible. Like I want that. Um, it just sometimes just doesn't seem fitting for myself. And I think that I have to take as a player, like I have to take initiative and say like, okay, it's not about getting mines. It's about like, if I'm open and I know I can make this layup or I know I can make this shot, like, let me take it. You know what I mean? Instead of making the extra pass to my teammate, that might not be a good extra pass. So um, I definitely have that mentality a lot. Like I always start games like, okay, you're going to go out here. You're going to finish all your layups. You're going to take those open jump shots. You're going to drive when it's open and you're going to block shots and be explosive and things like that. Um, I just like, I think that's a personal hump that I have to get over. It's just like that I, practice that I can do it so do it in a game and it'll go through things like that so I just have to push myself harder I think um to actually get to that point or that's like a reality now this question might have a more philosophical bent to it but I'd be curious to get your reaction because even though I didn't know you all that much until I did that Apple Valley Eastview section final a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, during your senior year, 
as I was uh, branching out with my coverage to get more schools, you know, uh, I guess you and I had some mutual friends or friends of friends. And whether it was, I think, uh, Don Ackerman, because I guess you played alongside one of his daughters in Traveling Ball, or yeah. uh, Sarah Scalia's father, the Carlins. Every time I mention your name, <laughs> their faces light up. And when I was looking mm -hmm. to have a guest commentator on for that section final, uh, Sarah's dad, Peter, the first name he said was yours. Is, how do you approach life? And how do you think that's helped you forge all these friendships? Yeah. Okay. Well, first, thank you so much. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I just try to live my life um, the most, in the most genuine way I can. and. Um, I kind of live my life by like certain things, like treat people um, the way you want to be treated, obviously, like, you know, golden rule, um, but like also like be the person you needed when you were younger. And I'm always constantly thinking about like, what would a little Michael want or what would she need right now? And like, I just always like, like that's how I treat like people younger than me. And like, also like people my age, I'm like, what would I want someone to do for me in this moment? Like, and I just like I always think like okay like like words of affirmation they feel good right like people lo like loving and supporting you and so I give all of that to other people and in the process of me giving that to other people like I take it in as well like when I cheer for my teammates and things like that it feels like I'm cheering for myself um and I just like I find I get so much joy from that like um being with other people and like cheering them on and um helping people like reach their goals is like one of my favorite things. I don't like, it's hard to explain. I guess you said, like you said, it's a little philosophical um, or like even helping people with homework and things like that. Like there's nothing better to me than when you're helping and working with someone and then like things finally click and you see that light bulb go off and you're just like, you did it. Like that's all you. And that's just like such a great feeling um, for both them and for me, I think. And uh, I just love being with people, honestly. Um, I like to talk and I love to listen to other people tell their stories and um, uh, yeah, like those are, those are some big things for me. And like, that's part of the reason um, why like this quarantine has been a little hard because I'm such a people person that like I miss the human interaction. Uh, and so I'll always hit, um, like I'll text my friends, like all these random questions. I'll just be like, thoughts on this guys. What do you think? I want to hear your opinions and just like random things. And um I just really enjoy working with people and um, I don't do it for like any sort of like accolade. I just, um, I just want to be like a genuine person that like when people think of me, I want them to be like, Oh, like I want them to think good, positive things. Like cause first impressions mean everything. And um, I'm, I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place, but uh it's just like, I just like being like a genuine, kind person because at the end of the day, like, that's what you want to be remembered for. And um, when you leave your mark on people, like, you want it to be a good mark and you want them to, um, like, you, you just want them to think of you. And because, like, I do the same thing for other people. Like, when I meet someone, I'm like, okay, this person was great. Like, like, I hope to see them again or just like random things like that. And like the way I see other people and the way I approach other people is the way I try to um, like approach myself with certain things. So I always like to think about myself and their shoes and what they would need and things like that. I'll never forget, you know, when that friendship uh, showed itself in that section final we did with Stillwater and White Bear Lake. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Sarah, Liza, when they found out, oh, you're part of the team. I just remember <laughs> Sarah, who, at least around me, is a little more stoic. And I know when she's with your yeah. peers, she's a little more outgoing. But <laughs> just seeing her face light up, like, are you serious? And uh, that was one of my favorite moments with you. And even going off what you said, uh, it explains why uh, you and maybe some of your teammates started following me after I did a couple of your games. And I think the first time I wasn't even calling it. I had Jessica January do it because she was in town and it's yeah. okay. Uh, whatever I'm doing, I guess I'm doing something right. Cause here's this random player from Apple Valley following me. And yeah. then I realized that we had more connections than I realized, but 
Mm -hmm. That's still cool though. Yeah, it is so cool. Basketball connects so many people. It does. And, and speaking of Jessica, were there any players that you looked up to, whether they were making their way at the high school or college level, Minnesota and the pros, when you embraced basketball as much as you did, who were the players that you emulated? Um, okay, so most notably, like right, the first person that came in my mind was Asia Wilson. I love her. Um, I'll never forget, like one of my first, like, I think it was my first Lynx game that I went to. It was when the Lynx were playing the, um, were playing them, the Aces, Thanks. and I, I walked in and I saw all of them standing there and I was like, oh, there they are. And I was like, they're real people. Like, it was just like the best thing ever to see them all play. And um, I just loved that. And um, I would say like other players that I like, I watched their game and I like it. Um, like Elena Deladon and um oh so many names like Maya Moore I I've never been like a guard necessarily but, like I just love like her finesse and the way she played um so she's like I would say she's one of my favorite players and um who else um players like Rebecca Brunson I just love how like ruthless she is on the boards and she's just so great um and uh yeah, I don't like this is so many players. I, like, I'm just like, oh, I love you. You're great. <laughs> um, and like when it comes to basketball, um, I like the high school and AAU level. Um, I don't know like players by name, I would say, but um, something like I've learned is like you want to emulate your game after the players you hate. So like there were so many players I ran into, especially this season, that I was like, oh my gosh, you're so annoying just from like the way you shoot, how it's just barely out of reach for a block or the way that like the shots go in all the time. Like I hated that about them, but like also like that's what I should want to emulate. Like I want like on a basketball court, like I want players like in a sense, like hate me and be like, oh, there she goes again kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's like, I think that's pretty cool. Um, and it's like a big mental game. Like, uh, it's like almost like reverse psychology, I guess. Uh, wanting to emulate your game after the players you don't like but I think that's cool and important and, and like basketball is is always challenging um and so yeah I would say like those those professional players and then just like players in general that I was just like oh my gosh I cannot I I hate your game but I love it kind of thing well, Michael, if you're trying to get others to hate you, I don't think it's working, at least with me. Because I feel the opposite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that being said, keep it up, because uh, I, I like you this way. Ah, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now, I understand that one of your worst jobs that you've ever had was the Renaissance Festival, according to my research. So, What's the story behind that? You know, what created the nightmare scenario from that summer right. job, if you don't mind? Yeah, okay. So it's actually like my worst and best summer job. And so I worked it three summers. Um, my first two summers, I had a great time. I loved it. Um, I like, I loved messing around with the people and just like talking to them and asking them how they were do, like what they were doing that day and I worked in like food booths and so we'd yell out to the people random stuff to get them to come by it and then like my last year that I did it um I had just as much fun yelling out to people all that stuff but um I didn't get paid all that much for it so like that was such a big downside that I was like I'm spending almost 10 hours here and I'm getting paid like next to nothing I it felt like and so like that was a, the worst part about it um and uh I guess it's not like all that awful but oh and the bees sorry that was awful the bees and the bugs that was that was pretty tough but um I always enjoyed just like messing around with the people that were there because everyone's there just to have a good time and um most people are always in a good mood so you just feed off each other's energy and have a good time with the people you're working with so that was something I enjoyed now, you mentioned how much you like to talk, how you like helping others, how you, you want to be 
that mentor to a younger version of yourself if you had the chance to meet? I know you've got plenty of years of college left, but where do you see yourself? You know, what ideas or thoughts do you have about where we could see Michael Parham down the road? Yeah, believe me, I, I'm wondering the same thing, <laughs> but I'm always thinking like things that I want to do. Um, so um, I've always had a dream of playing overseas potentially. Um, or I think I want like, uh, as of right now, I, I'd like to go to law school, I think, and do something in politics. And so from there, it's just like one thing after the other, but like doing something in politics, your background, your graduate school and undergrad can look different for everyone. And I think law is the way I want to achieve that. And so law school, pretty much any degree is good for that. And so um, to, for undergrad, um, I've been thinking about doing like um, a major in political science on a public policy track with a minor in Spanish. Um, being able to communicate with as many people as possible is so important to me. And Spanish is something that I've always had a uh, strong connection to. Um, or I, I, and I just enjoy it. Um, so that would be my pathway potentially. And like with that, um, I could do work with nonprofits and potentially start my own or do more with um, like policy making, like lawmaking and things like that. Uh, I think that would be amazing. Uh, any like um, I've been to DC three times in my life I think and every time that I've been I just loved it and I love it there I love how I just like the feeling and the, like everything about it I guess uh, I kind of fell in love with that area um, I just think it's so cool and uh, just like the history as well that's there I love that and um, so who knows maybe I'll do that or I don't know where the wind will take me, but um, I've always loved uh, traveling as well. So who knows, uh, maybe travel the world and find some place else that I like and then want to call home other than the United States. I don't know. I like to keep my options open, I guess. You mentioned having a strong connection to Spanish. Uh, can you explain what that connection is? Mm -hmm. I'm guessing you, uh, have some familiarity with the language, but yeah, I imagine there's more too. Yeah, so um, really my connection is I took it for six years. I took it all six years and in like uh, middle school and high school. And my senior year, I went um, for a week to Spain with my uh, class. And I stayed with the host family for like four of those days. And um, in a small town called Ocaña and um, just outside Madrid and I just like like I just like the culture um, and I just think it's so cool um, to learn about that and have an appreciation for other people's cultures and then another thing with it is like all throughout middle school and high school and um, the rest of the college because I'll be taking it it makes your small corner of the world so much bigger it opens up the doors to hear about other authors and other like music and movies and just like people and their way of life it's so different from yours because so often I think we get so um, narrow-minded and focus on like my life in the midwest this small suburb whatever but there's just so much more out there and when I went to travel like when I traveled there it just made me realize like our lives are so different like right now it's so different compared to like what they're doing in who knows you know like different parts of the world and i think that's my connection to it is that spanish has like opened up the rest of the world to me and opened up that appreciation you had a great high school career at apple valley got a scholarship to play at creighton and now you're making your way through your ranks as a college student athlete so with everything you've experienced thus far, what would you tell your younger self if you had a chance to meet up with her? Yeah. Um, I think the first thing I would say is just like live in the moment and continue to cherish all the little things. And um, that's something I try to do all the time, but I would just put a special emphasis on that. Um, and for me, like, that's why my 
like certain things like my senior year a lot of people talk about how it flew by and for me I my senior year like I did everything I lived in the moment I did everything that I could I stayed out late with my friends I did all the weird stuff that high school students do um just random things like that so just like live in the moment and it'll be easier to remember um remember like the good good times and things like that um other thing another thing I would tell her is like just like to continue to be yourself um I feel like I've always had a strong sense of self and uh it like I always continue to improve that of course um and I'm still working at that but just like continuing to do that and um share that experience with other people I think would be um something I would tell my younger self and um it's a good question um <laughs> I guess those two things I would stress and then just like other bits and pieces like like things that other people would probably say too like stay out late with your friends or um go the extra mile with just like go the extra mile I guess to make it a general statement um because it's always worth it to go the extra mile and you always feel better about things uh, after you put given your all and a little bit more um yeah i would say those things were are probably the three big things and then i just want to get your thoughts on this because uh, around the start you mentioned how women's basketball is still working to get the same level of recognition and mm -hmm. appreciation as the men do. And you know, I got a glimpse of that this past season, covering some Hopkins games with Paige Beckers and you know, South yeah. Carolina. You mentioned Asia Wilson, huge following with what Don Staley's been able to do other places too. And so, you know, you're a part of that, of course. And I don't know what your future holds as far as tournaments and accolades, but what do you make of the sport getting more publicity with the likes of Wilson, Sabrina Ionescu and others? And how excited are you for the future of the sport? You know, whether or not you're playing in it in a few years time. Yeah, it's amazing. I love it. I, I love to see it. Um, the work that they're doing, like they're just, they're doing the same thing all the women before them have done. And I think, and they're able to capitalize it with social media and things like that and grow their followings there. And um, uh, I don't, like players like Sabrina, like she's so amazing. I like, just like her game speaks for itself. Like, um, which is crazy. Like that many people, I don't know like what their turnouts and things like that were, but like, I'm sure it was kind of almost similar. Like not that many, just not that many people in general will follow women's basketball. And I'm sure they had a great following um a lot of people came but like her game would like their game would speak for themselves everyone on that team and same with Asia Wilson like um and things like that and I think um I think I don't know I don't know I'm kind of lost for words right now like it's just amazing how many like strides that have been taken and um there's so much more room to grow but uh like the steps are being taken to um make women's basketball more um accessible and not like and more appealing almost to everyone and i i think that's so great and i think it's very necessary and important when people are involved others take notice especially you know for women's hoops and like you said i'm really excited to see what happens and i'm definitely excited to see what you can do as well and yeah uh, i know everyone would love to like win a tournament go to the big dance but you know, what are some goals that you have as you continue your college experience um so like basketball goals or yeah, yeah just what you like to do for basketball if there was anything you could add to your resume if you knew you had the chance it's just one of those like okay if you knew or if we can make this happen you know what would you like you know what would you okay. like to get out of uh your remaining years at Creighton. Okay, so for basketball, I would. I know. I know you mentioned this. Um, but I would love, love, love to make it to the NCAA tournament. And it's crazy because we almost we would have made it um, this last season, 
and then um but like it'd be so cool to go or for me I think it'd be really like a goal I have um or that I would like to do is I would love to win a like a, a big east title either regular season or like the tournament um I think that would be so cool just to have that moment you know like where you've worked at it for so long and for me I've never won like a state championship game or anything like that and so um I think like that would be a really cool experience um as for um other basketball goals um I by my senior year this is uh this is young Michael talking to older Michael I better be dunking I would hope to <laughs> and uh as for like school wise um there's this like tower at Creighton called Creighton like it's a a hall Creighton Hall and uh, there's this thing called the Golden Elevator and it takes you to the top floor and that's where like the Jesuits will I don't know what they do there I think they hang out or something and you can only go up if a Jesuit takes you and so my goal I think almost every Creighton student's goal is to be able to go up on the ride the Golden Elevator and take it to the top floor and see what's up there um so that's a that's a goal of mine okay so are you working on getting those uh, connections uh, to make that happen i'm trying yeah <laughs> and i know we've covered a lot but is there anything else you'd like to add about your story your hopes your experiences fears anything just you know what this will be important to like a basketball community um the mj versus uh lebron debate I take the same stance that Kobe Bryant had. I think that we can appreciate and build both players up. We don't have to pit them against each other. Um, so I will not say who like the GOAT is because I think they're both great. <laughs> Always good to catch up with you and yes. learned a lot about you over this last hour and change. And yeah. I just can't wait to see what happens. I'm hoping we can play games again next winter fingers uh, crossed you know we'll have to see obviously how everything plays out but mm -hmm. you know it sounds like you're making the most of this situation and who knows like when we do get to play games i imagine yeah. we're going to hear all about these new talents and abilities and interests just because you know we're so used to these routines where you know for me i'm prepping games and going mm -hmm. and calling them and you have the workouts and the practices and a huge commitment and now here both of us are with a lot of time on our hands to try out things that maybe yeah. we never would have done mm -hmm. without it so uh, you mentioned writing all these things down that might be something just just write down a list and then i don't know write a book or who knows i yeah. could see you doing anything who knows write a book i, mean, I like hey, that and i know you're busy these days but if you ever wanted to give broadcasting another try, I'll keep a microphone open for you, too. Okay, okay. <laughs> Michael Parham, you will see her at some point playing games again for Creighton University as she continues her college career down in Omaha, Nebraska. And if you want to be a guest on a future episode, whether it's virtual or in person of our talk show series, just hit us up at tsbtelevision at gmail.com or find me on social media, the Mike Peden on Twitter and Instagram. Michael, once again, thanks for joining us. And thank you for watching another episode of Mike Up Sports.